All right, everyone. Hello, I am Gregory Tall from JB Training Solutions. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we are here to talk all about interviewing and hiring people for our businesses. We are talking about, we've done the work, we've recruited folks, we have a great pool of applicants. Now we're at the stage where it's time to meet people one-on-one -on -one and figure out if they have what it takes to be successful inside our business. And it's really hard because in a course of a few minutes of a conversation or maybe a few hours at absolute most, we're trying to make a lot of solid assessment to determine if we're going to extend a job offer to this person or not. So today's workshop is designed to help us make sure we're making sound, fair, good, equitable decisions, but also doing it in a way where we're kind of moving through the process in a timely fashion to let us get things done. And we're going to move in three movements for today's workshop. So first, we'll talk about things to do even before the interview. So before someone shows up on site, before we meet them in person, what are some things we need to do beforehand to make sure we're prepared for a productive, a good, uh, a helpful conversation? Next, we'll talk about some things to do actually during the interview itself. So how to structure it, how to have a good conversation, how to make sure we're leading the conversation in such a way to get the absolute most out of people and to give them the opportunity to really share what they've been able to do and accomplish in past positions. And last but not least, we'll talk about some things to do after the interview. So uh, this part is just as important as all the parts before it, uh, just like it's important to prepare in advance, just like it's important to make sure the conversation itself goes well. It's so critically important to make sure that once we wrap things up, that we're ending things in a place that's going to put us in a position to, again, make the best possible decision for our business when it comes to deciding who we're going to hire. Um, and we have to do all this stuff, quite honestly, in a fairly short amount of time. In a perfect world, we'd have just tons and, and days and weeks and months to make a hiring decision. But in reality, we need to make one pretty quickly because, one, we probably already have some kind of an unmet need in the business, which is why we are hiring in the first place. But also, even from the candidate perspective, it's so important. And there's this recent survey that came out from Robert Half International. And in short, what it said was that when people are coming in for a job interview, if they're not hearing something within a couple weeks, and it doesn't have to be necessarily a firm decision, but simply hearing what's happening, what's going on, they start to lose interest. So what it means is, again, we have to move pretty quickly from the perspective of just kind of meeting business needs. But also when it comes to candidates, we need to make sure we're moving quickly because Otherwise, what tends to happen is we spend lots of time meeting with people and doing interviews, and then we extend the job offer only to find out they've accepted a job offer elsewhere from somebody else who's already beat us to extending that offer. So today's conversation is about making sure that we have, again, a process that helps us choose uh, the most highly qualified person we can possibly get, but then also doing so in a way that's going to be fair, it's going to be equitable, and it's also going to allow us to move with some extent, um, some ability of speed. And the reason why I'm bringing up the idea of speed here is because, of course, the faster we go, the more likely it is that we're going to make a decision that starts to rely upon not good, solid decision making, but more so upon our biases, these mental shortcuts that we have. So when we meet someone and we look at the way they're dressed, we look at their smile, we start judging based on their handshake, um, what kind of energy they show up with to the job interview. These are all things I'm saying are not not important at all, but things that we don't want to make our hiring decision based upon those factors. So the critical question becomes, how do we go about having an interview process where it is going to be um, equitable, it's going to be inclusive, and we're ensuring that, but also doing so in a way it's going to be allowing us to move through the process in somewhat of a, of a timely fashion. And I'll tell you from my experience doing interviews, I've done thousands of interviews for every imaginable level of position, everything from kind of the entry level individual contributor to an executive level role. And what I will tell you is this, there are tons of different levels of competence when it comes to interviewing. So we'll see everything from people who are very inexperienced in interviewing, whether it's because it's their first job interview ever, or because they simply have not had an interview in quite some number of years because they've not been looking for a position in a long time to people who are very skilled, very talented, uh, very adept at interviewing. They know how to be charismatic. They know how to say all the right things, know how to give answers in all the right ways. And we kind of see two things can possibly happen there. Um, sometimes we can end up missing out on a really strong candidate who simply is not a good interviewer. And in some cases, we can end up choosing to hire someone who probably is not the strongest candidate, but who is an excellent interviewer. 
So today we're going to talk about some things we can do in the interview itself to help us make sure we're kind of getting through all that stuff. And no matter what level of interviewee the person is, no matter how experienced they are, how do we make sure we're allowing them to put their best foot forward so we can make a solid, equitable, and just quite honestly, just a very objective assessment about what candidates that we're looking at. So I'm going to present to you a few different variations of questions. These are questions I've seen hiring managers use at different stages of the interview process. And I'm just going to have you evaluate and think about how good of a question you think this is when it comes to attempting to evaluate someone that you're interviewing. So here is the first question. This position requires lots of teamwork. You've done plenty of that, right? Now, again, these questions I'm sharing with you right now are questions I've seen managers use in real life during job interviews. And for this first one, I would say this is not a very good question for a couple of reasons. First of all, no matter how horrible the person is, we know the answer is going to always be yes. How do we know that? Because we've already given them a little bit of insight into this is required for the position, so you better say yes. So once again, if we have a candidate here who maybe is not the absolute best at collaboration, we've already told them it's critically important to the job, how are you at doing that? So we're probably more times than not going to get a yes. But here's the other part of this. Even if we do get a yes, once we have that yes, we don't really have any more context or really any more idea about why or how they think they are a good collaborator. So this question, while it might be one you used before, you might have heard other people use before, is not one that I'd recommend. Let's take a look at another question. So once again, we're trying to get a sense of how this person collaborates with other people. What about this one? How would you rate yourself when it comes to being a team player? Again, it's a question I've seen lots and lots of majors use. Some variation, some form of this question where you're asked to rate yourself. And the scale can be from 0 to 10. It can be from 0 to 100. It can be from 0 to 100 million. It does not particularly matter. Because once again, what we're most likely going to get here is we're most likely going to get someone who's going to lean towards rating themselves higher, even if it's not well justified based upon kind of recognizing this is important and that I don't want to rate myself pretty, you know, low at all. So if you say the scale is from 0 to 10, I'd have a hard time imagining, no matter how horrible someone has been, no matter how horrible they are at collaborating, they're probably not going to ever rate themselves much lower than I'd say probably an 8. That's probably the lowest you'll see. You'll probably have some 10s in there, probably some 8s, some 9s from those who are kind of trying to seem like they're a little bit more modest <laughs> with their approach. But in reality, again, whatever number you get, whether it's 8, it's 9 out of a scale of 10. If it is, you know, 98 out of a scale of 100, once you have that number, well, that number is very subjective. So what you consider to be a 90, someone else might consider to be an 80. So we don't really have lots of specific information about um, what that number means and what it's going to mean for someone showing up on your team. And by the same token, you also don't have any idea about what that even means in terms of how the person collaborates. So if they say they are a 97 in collaboration, well, that number is pretty high, but we still don't have any sense of what it's actually like to work with that individual. So here's a third possible question I've seen managers ask. What about this one? How would you deal with a team member whose communication style is very different than yours? Now, we like this one a lot more because now I'm asking the person to actually give me some examples about how would you approach a situation where you're working with someone, their style is very different than your own. What would you do in that situation? And this is almost a good question. Now, to be fair, it's certainly 100% better than either of the previous two questions, but I'm saying it's almost a good question for this reason, because I'm asking, what would you do? And let me tell you why that can be potentially a concern when we're doing a job interview. If you were to ask me right now, Greg, suppose you were flying a commercial jet. By the way, I'm not a commercial pilot. I've never flown a jet. You should not be on any flight that I am flying, all right? Not as a passenger, but as a pilot. You know what I'm saying there? Okay, so what I'm saying is if you ask me that question, I could give you a very compelling answer that would sound pretty good. I would tell you about how so it is so important to remain calm and to communicate with my first captain with air traffic control to come onto the PA and let the passengers know that we're going to have some of an unusual landing, but to have your seatbelts fastened, keep those trays in the upright position, Follow the instructions of your flight, flight crew. We're going to land. I'll have a great answer. It sounds pretty convincing, right? But here's the thing. I have never landed 
a commercial jet. As a matter of fact, I've never even flown a commercial jet. But what I can do is I can give you a very compelling answer about what I would do if I were in that situation. But I've never actually done it, and I'm in no way skilled to actually land a commercial jet. And that, my friends, is the issue with this question. We're asking someone about what they would do, and we don't really know for sure if they actually have done it or if they actually can do it. We know they can think through it. We don't know if they can actually do it. They've actually done it at some point in the past. So let me give you one more question to think about when you're going through interviews, and that's this last one. Tell me about a time you worked on a project or a task with someone whose communication style was very different than yours. This is the question that I really like. This is the question where no matter how experienced or inexperienced someone is when it comes to the art, the science of interviewing, this is the question that will allow them to share with us some of their actual past experience in the workplace, or if they're you know, someone who's just entering the workplace, perhaps they might be pulling an example from a volunteer experience or from some kind of an academic experience. But whatever the case is, we know for sure now when they've dealt with someone whose style is different than their own, here is exactly what they did. And this helps us to make an evaluation in a few ways. First of all, we're not talking about hypothetical. We're not talking about theoretical here. We're talking about actual past performance. This is what someone has actually done. And presumably, based on the story they're going to tell, um, probably they've done it fairly well. The other thing is this. It kind of removes from it that, that chance to cheat a little bit here. So again, if you have someone who's very experienced at interviewing and they kind of know all the right things to say and all the charismatic ways to present themselves, well, now they have to give a real-life example about how they actually work with someone whose style is different than their own. And by the same token, if you have someone who comes in and they're very anxious or nervous and there's kind of a little bit jittery going into the interview, they can still reflect back on a real-life experience they've had where they've worked successfully with someone whose style is different than their own. So when we talk about this approach, this has a name. This is called a behavior-based interview. Now, I put on the slide here, engage candidates in behavior-based conversations. But the premise is very straightforward and very simple. The idea is that the best predictor of future performance is, guess what? Past performance. So the best way to take a look and get a, a realistic expectation of what someone's likely to do if you hire them for your team, for your business, is to take a look backward and see what they've done previously. So in other words, whatever things they've done in past circumstances that are similar to yours, Chances are, if faced with the same circumstances, once again, they'd repeat those same actions or that same approach, or that same kind of methodology of thinking or resolving a problem. So in short, the best way to really get um, an, an objective assessment of someone, the best way to really make sure that you're cutting through and moving past all the biases is to ask people to tell you stories about their past experiences. Ask them to tell you a story that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the key here is when we talk about behavior-based interviewing is the focus really is tell me about a specific past experience you've had, not what would you do, not what do you generally do, not what you do most of the time, but again, give me a specific story about a specific past experience you've had. That's going to be the best way for me to understand and see what you've done, uh, where your competence, where your skill lies, uh, how you think about things, how you approach problems, how you approach collaboration. And that's going to give me the single best way of making that determination. Thank you so much for tuning in for today's demo. And I hope you'll get the full program to get into all the nitty gritty before, during, and after the interview about how to make an assessment to help us hire the absolute best people for our businesses.